All right, I think it's about time for us to uh, get this party started. Uh, I hope everyone uh, is doing well today. Uh, we're getting close to the end, so let me, let me tell you a bit where we are and where we're going. Um, <clears throat> this morning, we're going to go back we're going to leave behind the, uh, the uh, overview of all the numerics that we've been doing for the past two or three days now. Uh, and we're going to go back to uh, more of a phenomenological perspective on, on liquid gas flows. Okay? Uh, we'll take three um, perspectives. The first one will be on the topic of breakup of droplets which I'm referring to as secondary breakup. So we'll take a look at some basic surface tension related effects from the perspective of the capability of the surface tension force of keeping a droplet together and how this process fails, so how breakup happens. So we'll talk about that uh, from a fairly high level perspective using some experimental data. We'll say here's what, what happens, what we observe. Then we'll talk about simple models that have been uh, put forward in order to, uh, to account for this process, to try to, to capture this process. Um, so that's going to be the phenomenology of uh, breakup uh, of droplets and the, uh, and, and the phenomenological models of the breakup of droplets. That's going to be the first topic. The second topic will be the um, phenomenology as well as phenomenological models of uh, droplet collisions. So we'll, take, we'll go back to collisions quickly, but we've uh, talked about collisions last week already. Uh, so we'll expand a bit on solid collisions, but very briefly. Um, but then we'll mostly talk about uh, droplet splashing on walls and droplet-droplet collisions. And again, from a phenomenological standpoint. And then the third topic will be the, 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 the uh, uh, um, more applied perspective of uh, spray formation. Uh, still related to breakup, but not, wake, uh, not breakup of uh, individual droplets, but instead breakup of jets, breakup of, uh, uh, of um, liquid streams. Okay? And so we'll, we'll, discuss, uh, we'll discuss that uh, last. Uh, so that's going to be today, this morning, and that's uh, going to essentially wrap up uh, our uh, discussion here. Tomorrow morning, what we'll do is uh, we'll have a more research-focused uh, uh, morning where I'll talk about uh, current research activities, uh, fairly recent uh, um, um, findings and, uh, and uh, progress uh, that we've done on that we've uh, made on liquid gas flows, and that will be also a bit more focused on breakup, uh, since uh, this is a lot of what uh, my research group is looking at. Uh, let me see. This afternoon, we will uh, throw out pretty much entirely our level set code and replace it by a VOF code. So that's, uh, that's going to take us uh, some time. We'll need to go through the details of the PLIC approach. So we'll derive it. We'll, we'll build it up in a way that is implementable. Uh, and you'll see it's not too complicated. PLIC itself is, is a pretty simple concept. So this idea of reconstructing with applying the interface from the knowledge of the uh, local volume fraction, but, but we'll do that. Um, once we've done that, we'll look at the uh, Lagrangian or semi-Lagrangian perspective to uh, geometric fluxing. So we'll actually look at how you would go and move those planar reconstructed surfaces. How do you actually move them around on your mesh? So we'll talk about simple ways of doing that, uh, but then we'll implement a less simple way of doing that. And this is where I'll take my major shortcut. I'll give you a routine that deals with all the required geometry uh, and, and we'll make use of this directly instead of implementing everything from, scra from scratch. And then we'll play it with our VOF, VOF code a little bit. So that's this afternoon. Um, and then uh, tomorrow afternoon, uh, we'll follow the schedule. Uh, so we'll have one more uh, hour of numerics in the afternoon when we'll, we'll talk about an alternative way of obtaining mass conservation properties for level sets and a few other missing things. In particular, I expect that we'll still be missing some discussion on compressible uh, multiphase flow, so we'll take the opportunity to discuss compressibility uh, head-on. 
And I think that's it. Then uh, I, I don't think we need to have a tutorial. I have a few examples. I think I'll just run in front of you during this, uh, this last hour. So uh, I don't know if we can meet here, but we'll figure it out and, and you'll be notified. Uh, I don't think we need to meet in the, uh, in the computer room, really. It's, it's not the best uh, place for you to see what, uh, what we're doing. OK, uh, so that's, that's the end of the, of the program. Any, um, any questions on where we are and where we're going? OK, so service tension and secondary breakup. By secondary breakup, I specifically mean droplets. Breakup, and I'll say why and in what respect we talk about secondary breakup. So, a quick word on uh, server extension first. Uh, I don't think we've sketched this yet, but the reason that server extension exists is because there's a drastically different interaction, um, uh, magnitude of uh, interaction forces between molecules whether you consider a gas phase or a liquid phase, okay? And so because you have this inherent uh, attraction between nearby molecules in a liquid, as soon as you remove this attraction by going outside of your phase, you end up with an effective local tension that applies on the molecules that exist at the edge of your phase. So this is the... Uh, the yeah, uh, very phenomenological perspective as to what, uh, what surface tension looks like. It's just the macroscopic observed consequence of the van der Waals forces acting on the terminating region of, of, uh, of liquid. So, you know, we talked about that already. There's nothing too, uh, uh, too surprising here. The effective tension is acting tangentially to the local point uh, of interest. So if you have a little surface element at the surface of your liquid, you're ac acting, this uh, tension is acting tangentially. The resulting force, if you, uh, if you integrate all this over the surface, is a force that is normal to your interface locally and tends to restore and remove the curving of that surface. And so we wrote already how this is, uh, how you can uh, write this resulting force, especially in the situation where uh, your surface tension coefficient is a function of the local co conditions and therefore changes with space and time. Uh, we don't need to play this game. You know that the pressure inside a, uh, uh, a droplet would be 2 sigma over r. The 2 coming from the fact that we're summing the two principal curvatures that are both of them 1 over r. Uh, if you're inside a, uh, a uh, liquid, uh, um, uh, sorry, a, a, a gas bubble that's contained inside the film, right? So, so you imagine a, a soap, soapy water film while well, you really have two interfaces. So you can accumulate the effect uh, of, uh, of that pressurize from the outside gas to the liquid film and then yet again that pressurize from the uh, liquid film to the inside bubble. What we played with that yesterday, there's nothing to... Um, Oh, uh, well, of course, I should have. OK, so here's a blue uh, square, dark blue square, rectangle, sorry. What this was showing is uh, a, um, I'm, I'm sure you've seen uh, those videos. They were taken by an astronaut on the, um, uh, on the space station. They were forming, they were uh, uh, a few years ago. Um, this guy was, uh, was forming large droplets that are easy, you know, in, in microgravity, it is easy to put together a large drop. And then he was using a straw to blow on it, so deforming very, in a very punctual way the interface. And what happens there is you form a capillary wave that evolves radially outward. Same way as if you had a pool, you throw a rock in it, and you have this, this, those nice capillary waves, uh, capillary waves radiating out. Well. That's exactly what they were doing, but on a nice sphere. And it's kind of unusual to see that. We're not used to seeing capillary waves curve like this on a, on a sphere. So this was a, a cool movie. So the idea is to say that um, you want to, uh, now, now we're throwing surface tension into the party. Uh, we've been used to thinking about 
flows on spherical objects from the perspective of Reynolds number ratio of inertia to, surface, to uh, viscosity. Now we have also surface tension. So as a result, instead of having one non-dimensional group, we have, well, pretty naturally three non-dimensional groups we can form. We can still look at the Reynolds number of the ratios of inertia to, vi to uh, viscosity, but you can look also at the ratio of inertia to surface tension or the ratio of uh, viscous forces to surface tension forces. So we'll define those, uh, those uh, groups and we'll give them name. The ratio of inertia to surface tension is what we call the Weber number. So this is inertia over surface tension. This would be your characteristic, uh, say in this case, drop diameter. And some characteristic velocity. Some reference velocity that could be just the slip velocity between the drop and the surrounding air. The C here indicates the carrier phase. So this is going back to our uh, Euler-Lagrange uh, notation. This is the surrounding uh, gas. Uh, so we're, here we're using a, uh, a gas Weber number. You can equally define your Weber number based on the liquid density. What really matters is that you know, in, in, de in deciding whether you should write a gas-based or liquid-based Weber number, the question that matters is what is relevant to the problem? Is it the liquid inertia or the gas inertia? So if you're looking at a problem where you say um, you have, for example, a, a liquid jet in quiescent air, the expectation is that the inertia is contained by your liquid, and therefore the liquid <laughs> Weber number would be what matters. In the same way, if you shoot a droplet at a wall, the momentum, the inertia is carried by the liquid, and so what really matters is rho of the liquid times the velocity of the liquid, and that's how you would compute your Weber number. Now, if you have a static liquid drop and you put it in a shock tube and you, and you suddenly accelerate the gas around it in order to break it up, well, a situation like that is the opposite. No one really cares about the inertia of, the, of your droplet. In fact, it's zero initially. What matters is the inertia of the gas that you use to break up, and then you would define the gas Weber number. So you just have to be, you know, like any non-dimensional group, you need to think carefully about how you would define it. Uh, I have a typo here. I don't know why the E disappeared. So the other number is the Unisorge number. The Unisorge number is the ratio of uh, the uh, viscous force to the surface tension force. So in uh, problems where inertia is not the dominant factor, the Unisorge uh, number can be very interesting. So typically low Reynolds number problems where surface tension plays a role can be uh, equally interesting uh, to look at. Obviously, we have only three forces we're looking at. We can't possibly define three non-dimensional groups and not have them be related to one another. And so what you can expect happens, your uh, Weber number, uh, your Reynolds number, and your Unisorg number are related. Okay, so Reynolds number, we all have a good intuition as, as to what that is. The Weber number surface tension is below. So a high Weber number flow is a flow wherein surface tension doesn't play a role. Typically, if you're looking at spray formation processes, the Weber number will be thousands, if not millions. So that's the point. If you want to form a spray, the surface tension wouldn't, shouldn't be in a position to hold the liquid together. It should let it break apart. If you're looking at um, uh, uh, um, you know, rain droplets, for example, well, by definition, they are of a size where if surface tension wasn't strong enough to keep them together, they would break further, and you would not observe them to be that large. Okay? That's kind of an obvious thing. Liquid uh, uh, a raindrop will fall at a velocity uh, that will give you an overall, with a size and a velocity that give you an overall Weber number that will naturally give you some inherent balance between uh, uh, surface tension and inertia. And so for a raindrop, you would expect a pretty limited uh, uh, Weber number. If you're looking at now a surface tension control process, 
Does that argument make sense? If the droplet had a higher Weber number, meaning the surface tension was less important, the drop would break further, and so we'd reduce the Weber number. Uh, if you look at the surface tension control flow, for example, just the formation of a meniscus at, uh, at the triple point, well, locally this thing would be controlled by the, uh, by the Weber number, uh, or can be represented in terms of a Weber number as well, if surface tension is enough to deform your interface in a significant way, that means that the flow has a, uh, a, uh, a pretty low Weber number, so surface tension is large. Okay. The other Zorge number, you know, you can make the same arguments uh, it relates to viscosity. Well, typically, again, if you're looking at the spray formation problem, the Jonas uh, uh, number will typically be small. Uh, by small, I mean pretty small. Uh, the viscosity is typically not a, a, a strong process. In, uh, you know, it's going to be a fraction of unity uh, in, in a lot of problems we're going to be interested in. Oh, yeah. Um, right here? Yeah, so the, the, here I was writing the, the, the slip. So the u of one phase minus the u of the other phase, so some measure of the difference in velocity. But uh, overall, you need some characteristic velocity squared. And again, this is the same idea as uh, for the, uh, the density. You would either use the liquid uh, density or the gas uh, density depending on what phase contains the momentum in the same way if you say you're looking at the um, uh, so, so for the problem we were looking at yesterday we ran this little jet right so we had this uh, well the initial thing we ran formed this uh, mushroom shape uh, this uh, liquid had a given diameter and the flow is coming out at some liquid velocity. Well, in this case, we had nothing happening except this liquid jet. The only thing we have inertialized in the liquid, we would naturally define a liquid Weber number, and then using all this, we would write a rho liquid, a u liquid squared, the diameter of this jet over the surface tension. Then we turned, out, we turned on this uh, fast co-flow, uh, much faster, so this, the velocity is pretty small, a much faster co-flow of gas. And now suddenly we said, well, now most of the momentum is in my gas. And so if you want to study a situation where this, the gas is what breaks everything up, it makes a lot of sense instead to define a gas-based Weber number. You can still use the same length scale. And so it's... You know, it depends on the physics of the, of the, of the problem of interest. Sure. Um, so, you know, in general, uh, the answer is yes, but it doesn't really matter. In the same way that when you define a Reynolds number, you don't try to get the full answer out of your Reynolds number. You, get, you try to get some idea of the regime in which you're, you are. So those numbers are not of critical importance. Uh, in this case, Yes, you could subtract the velocity, and, and so that's what I was catching here, uh, what I was uh, writing here, and it would probably be a slightly more accurate representation of what's going on. But in most instances, it doesn't really matter. You need some measure of the amount of momentum in the relevant phase. That's um, you know, uh, uh, non-dimensional numbers like these don't, don't matter in a very quantitative way. They matter in a qualitative way. Uh, you'll notice that if you increase the uh, velocity of a jet, for example, the Reynolds number goes up linearly with the velocity, the Weber number goes up dramatically with the velocity. So just a, a small observation that uh, uh, you can get to... Uh, inertia can dominate surface tension faster or more easily than it can dominate uh, viscous effects. Ah, well, yeah, okay, of course, so we still have this, uh, I was hoping that this would be just one file that would be affected, but uh, I guess the, all the files have the same problem. Um, so sorry again about the uh, low resolution images here. 
So let's take a very basic approach to thinking about drop breakup. We're going to take experimental findings and discuss, discuss the phenomenology of those experimental findings. Um, take a drop. Uh, well, imagine you have a simple wind tunnel. Well, simple. You have a wind tunnel. A flow from uh, one direction to the other, the control velocity, uniform flow, no turbulence. And you simply form a drop, well, again, simply, you form a drop uh, through some process in a way that, that where you can control the size of the rocket. And you let it fall under gravity and hit this region of, of, uh, of, uh, of a flow from left to right uh, from your wind uh, uh, within your wind tunnel. If you do this, what you'll see is that the drop will essentially not care about low enough velocity flows. In particular, uh, it, it will just remain spherical. And as you increase the velocity of the flow, of the, of the cross flow, you'll find that the drop will deform, it will break, and it will break more and more viol violently as the velocity of the problem increases. You find that by changing the parameters, uh, you observe that what controls really the response of the droplet to this cross flow, or to this sudden uh, gaseous velocity, uh, what controls the response is the Weber number. It's the ratio of inertia, specifically the inertia from the gas to the surface tension holding the drop together. Okay, so we're going to look at this problem from the perspective of what happens as you crank up the Weber number from low values, meaning surface tension dominated flows, to high values of the Weber number, meaning fully uh, uh, gas inertia dominated flow, flows, wherein it's as if you didn't have surface tension. Um, all right, so first of all, one of the main findings is that you already need, so this is all experimental um, uh, findings, you find the existence of a critical value of the Weber number at about 12. What does that mean? Well, it means that if you have a cross flow characterized by a Weber number less than 12, you won't see breakup. Your droplet will not respond to, uh, well, it might deform, but it will not break due to the flow. As soon as you are above this critical value of the Weber number, the drop breaks. So that's the first observation. It takes about 10 times more inertia than you have surface tension holding the drop together in order to be able to really uh, change the topology of a droplet, which is something about the, uh, the, uh, the um, well, it says both, it says two things. It says that a sphere is a pretty streamlined object. You, know, you can't really take this uh, rho u squared uh, directly and convert it and uh, uh, get the entire force out of it because the flow goes nicely around and you have a, uh, a fairly smooth flow around. So you don't actually, the drop doesn't actually rest the gas flow and it doesn't get the entire effect of the, of the dynamic pressure from the gas. So it says something about how streamlined the droplet is. It also says something about how stable a spherical shape is uh, under the surface tension. So the first thing we see as we go above a value of, uh, of, um, of uh, 12 is the, that droplets will start oscillating typically with a mode 2. So remember yesterday we played with this drop and we added a, uh, a radius that was a function of the angle so that we could deform it into ellipsoids or multi-lobe shapes. But if you take a mode 2, basically an ellipsoidal mode or a dumbbell type mode uh, for, for your droplet, well this is what you observe is happening to that droplet. It will flatten and then stretch, flatten and stretch. Once you get to a Weber number of about 12, you start to see that this oscillation will lead to the droplet splitting into two. So that's the first observation. As you crank up from there, the, um, the Weber number 
a little bit further, you see a fairly wide range of parameters. Well, I should probably write over this because it's so resolution. So that's 12. Once you go, um, so if you're below 50, you go into what's called back breakup. What is back breakup? Well, it's pretty much exactly what it sounds. Uh, the flow is going to flatten the droplet and it's going to start inflating it as a balloon. And you see then a very thin film, three-dimensional film, filled with gas, being inflated and stretched until it falls at a length scale where molecular forces leads to the rupture of that film. And ultimately, you'll get a fairly uh, a fine spray out of that, uh, a, a collection of, uh, well, very much uh, by model spray, by the way, because the rim here, due to the effect of surface tension, will be thicker. And as a result, you'll have large drops coming from the breakup of the rim and very small drops coming from the breakup of the uh, inflated bag. Uh, this is pretty easy to see. It doesn't take a lot of effort if you have a water hose and uh, that uh, flows reasonably fast. You can make it flow up. You'll detach fairly large blobs of uh, liquid and as they start falling under gravity, if your droplet is about that big, you'll effectively see after maybe a meter of uh, free fall of that, of that uh, blob of liquid, you'll see it inflate into a bag. So it's if you want to make an experiment at, at home with this, it's, it's pretty easy to do. As you crank up uh, the uh, Reynolds number, uh, sorry, the, uh, the Weber number a bit further, uh, another factor of two or so. You get a, uh, a um, somewhat different response of the flow, but still essentially bag break up except we find that uh, instead of inflating a bag just like this, you'll inflate a corona. So the middle part of this liquid will remain stable, the flow will be able to inflate, uh, will inflate essentially multiple bags within this flattened droplet. And you'll end up with a fairly large region of liquid that will not be part of this inflation of the bag. And so the only reason why it's, uh, so it's, a, it's kind of a sub, uh, subset of uh, the general back breakup phenomenon, but it does lead to uh, even larger droplets because of the central stem region. So anyway, the, uh, the main point is if your Weber number is on the order of, well, small all the way up to 10, your drop will be stable. If your uh, Weber number goes up by an order of magnitude, another order of magnitude, so from 10 to the order of 100, the droplet now will become unstable. And the basic mechanisms for instability involve essentially your droplet flattening out or oscillating as a dumbbell, but basically behaving in a way that's fundamentally controlled by the capillary physics of, of, uh, of surface tension. So you'll have a drop and you'll see essentially waves that will, that will involve the entire length scale of the droplet. Uh, and so either you'll see those full drop oscillation or this is the inflation of a full, modus, a full drop oscillation as well. If I go back uh, to what we talked about yesterday, not yesterday, Monday, sorry. So we talked about the Rayleigh plateau instability. So I'm switching back to, uh, to Monday, uh, where we talked about this idea. Um, well, I'm sorry, I don't want to talk about the Rayleigh plateau instability. I want to talk about um, the effect of surface tension. Uh, where were we? So when we were talking about this problem, the, so the general Kelvin-Amos instability, we formally did that in such a way that we obtained uh, right here. We had this dispersion relation that contain the effect of shear, of gravity, and of surface tension. Well, let's look at the characteristic time scale that we would expect for uh, dynamics of a droplet controlled by surface tension uh, uh, mediated waves. So if capillary physics, capillary oscillations of the droplet is what control the, um, the, uh, the breakup, 
we should be able to say something concrete about the time scale. Well, we did talk about that already. We simplified the problem a bit, but we said ultimately that if you're interested in the uh, phase speed of water waves under the effect of gravity and under the effect of surface tension, we obtain that relation here. So remember we said this is the, uh, the wave speed, this is uh, the contribution from uh, gravity, k is the wave number, therefore it is coefficient times 1 over the wavelength. And this was the contribution from, uh, from the uh, capillary aspect of things. And so on one end we said if this term dominates we end up with gravity waves, on the other end if this term dominates we end up with capillary waves. So this is our capillary, uh, capillary wave term. So if the capillary physics dominate, the wave speed should be controlled by this. What is this? This is sigma over the density of the liquid times essentially the uh, wavelength of the, uh, of the wave. We're interested here in waves that are characterized by the full size of the droplet. So for our case, we're looking at a, uh, oscillations that are involving the entire drop. We'll put the full uh, droplet diameter here instead of the, uh, of, uh, of the wavelength. So we'll have a sigma, so to estimate our wave speed, we'll have the square root of sigma over rho times the radius of the drop. I don't want the wave speed, I want the characteristic amount of time it takes for that, those capillary dynamics to lead to breakup of my drop. If I replace my wave speed, um, if, I, if I take uh, the, the, the characteristic length scale, again my drop diameter or my drop radius, divided by that wave speed, I'll get a characteristic time scale. Okay? So at this point I have So I've said that the uh, U capillary is going to be a sigma, square root of sigma over rho uh, times the radius of my droplet. If I want to form a time scale, I need to divide that by the radius and take the inverse of it. So dividing that by the radius means putting a cubed power here and then taking the inverse. So that means that the characteristic time scale for my capillary breakup physics should be a rho liquid r cubed over sigma all this square root. So this is just by looking at our stability analysis uh, from before we, uh, we, can, uh, we can directly obtain this, uh, th this idea of what the capillary uh, time scale for my problem should be. So I'm going to switch back right here. And this is what I wrote right here. This is, in fact, what is observed. Experimentally, the amount of time it takes to go from this, for the situation where the drop is expo exposed to the flow, to this, the full breakup of the problem, scales according to that, uh, to, to, to that quantity. So indeed, that confirms that this is a surface tension control breakup. This is surface tension waves, control waves that, that lead to that breakup. So this is breakup dominated by capillary waves. Okay, let's add to this um, by going to higher velocities. So if we keep increasing the Weber number and now go not one order, uh, or continue going uh, after a second order um, of magnitude increase. So now this is a Weber all the way up to 350 or so. Now we see a complete change in the phenomenology. We're not looking at dynamics that are uh, based on the full droplet responding to the flow. We start seeing that essentially there's a surface flow, the, 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 the presence of, uh, of a very high rate of shearing from the gas at the surface that leads to 
ligaments and droplets stripping off the surface of the, uh, the very edge, edge of the droplet. And as this happens, the, drops shrink, the drop shrinks because the mass is being pulled away, and, and that's what we get. Uh, I have this, uh, on the order of 350 uh, Weber number, there's this slightly different uh, mechanism that's observed as well. Not enormously different, but you see in the front end of the droplets that waves are starting to develop at the surface, and those waves get stripped, or uh, see liquid stripped from themselves uh, directly. So this is an, uh, a slightly different version uh, compared to this. But overall, the idea is any type of surface stripping is what uh, surface stripping is that is what starts dominating as we go to higher Weber numbers. At this point, experiments show this now becomes the proper scaling for the time scale to break up. You'll notice that surface tension doesn't show up here. It's not a big surprise. We've made it now small enough that it shouldn't really play an explicit role. Well, we can see uh, where this comes from. So if now I go back to my previous analysis um, that we had right here, let's go back up here. Uh, we want a time scale, a growth rate right here is directly a time scale. Uh, well, I'm sorry, this is the inverse of a time scale. So right here I have uh, the inverse of the characteristic time scale for the instability that, that, we've, that we've looked at already. Gravity doesn't play a role in our problem. Let's not worry about this guy. Surface tension, well, we talked about this and this is what was dominating for lower Weber numbers. As we crank up the Weber number, the surface tension is not expected to be what controls the problem. So let's ignore this and let's just focus on this part. Well, what is this part? This is rho liquid times rho gas divided by rho liquid plus rho gas squared. Well, approximately, if you're looking at the water droplets in the air, rho liquid plus rho gas is more or less rho liquid. So what that is, is rho liquid times rho gas divided by essentially rho liquid squared. I can simplify the rho liquids, I end up with simply a density ratio. Okay? So this is rho gas over rho liquid. This is a length scale uh, for my problem, that I'll still, uh, for which I'll still use the uh, size of the droplet. Um, I'm sorry, this is the inverse of a length scale, so this is, uh, this k squared is really uh, uh, an, an r squared in the denominator, and this is the characteristic velocity that I'm exposing my, uh, my droplet to, squared. So if I can, if I can take, if I take this and extract the time scale from this, So my time scale for uh, shear should be my gamma r inverse, which should be from what we just wrote here, the square root of, so we said rho liquid squared times r squared divided by rho liquid rho gas times the uh, velocity to which we're exposing our uh, squared, sorry. And so I can get rid of this and get rid of that. So that should just be the square root of the density ratio times r over u. Okay, that's what, uh, what this should look like. So if I go back right here, you find that this is exactly what, uh, you f what, what controls this problem experimentally. So indeed, this is a shear and stability controlled uh, mode of, uh, of breakup of the droplets. If you go, if you keep going, go a little bit further, uh, things become, at some point, the, the, um, 
this is more of a problem of uh, ratio of, of, of momentum between the phases. There's so much velocity in, uh, associated with the gas phase that it has enough momentum to push away the liquid as if the liquid wasn't there. And the consequence of that is you start seeing the gas simply penetrate directly within uh, the, the liquid droplet. So it flattens it a bit, but it continues pushing through and punching holes through it. So this is what's been referred to as catastrophic breakup. Uh, the um, the, the, uh, the timescales for this are very short. They're still stripping at the surface, but the idea is the drop is pulled apart right away. So I have a few images for that, uh, for those processes. Uh, coming essentially from shock tube uh, um, uh, facilities. This is back breakup. What you're seeing here, I don't know how well you can see it, but this is the rim. And this weird thing here is this strange shaped, is a strange shaped uh, uh, bag of liquid. So this continuous film of liquid being inflated uh, and separating the, 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 the gas pushing from inside from the gas outside. At some point this breaks, this ruptures, and the result is a very fine spray. And a little bit later on, the rim ruptures, and those are, th that gives rise to larger droplets. If we crank up the Weber number by another magnitude, we get to this sheet stripping mechanism. Don't mind these guys, it's just another drop. Uh, it's, uh, this is an experiment where a continuous train of drops were sent to be uh, uh, visualized. So you see this drop is uh, uh, just about to start uh, breaking up. And here there's another, uh, there's three drops in this image. But you can see that we have essentially a, <coughs> I'm sorry, have essentially a, a pancake type shape from which long ligaments are being pulled off, are being stripped. And this is an example of this catastrophic breakup that's characterized by the fact that there's multiple um, uh, pathways through which the, uh, the gas is penetrating within the, the liquid. It makes for much more complicated analysis. Here you have a single pancake being stripped uh, of, of its mass at the surface. Here you have an ugly mass, essentially. OK, so and that, of course, yeah, well, I need to be connected. This was a video of that, but that's yeah, we've seen stills. So let's talk about how one would go about modeling a process like this. The simplest idea that you can think of would probably be if you look at what's going on right here, the very top image here shows this very simple oscillation of that drop. And on that mode, it seems very reasonable to think of a spring, uh, a mass spring damper system as a model for this, as a dynamical model for this. And that's what uh, we're going to discuss first in the context of this TAB model. TAB stands for Taylor Analogy Breakup. The Taylor analogy being specifically this idea of representing the dynamics of a droplet in the form of in a, a mass spring damper system. So this is the way we're going to attack this problem. We're going to formulate uh, a model for, well, the mass is not too complicated, but we're going to uh, uh, estimate the force due to the flow on the drop estimate the, uh, the, the, some sort of a spring-like response, and we're going to add some damping to this process. So this is going to be a 1D linear model of a 3D spherical drop. First of all, the external force. External force is fairly simple to think, um, to, to conceptualize. This is essentially a measure 
of the uh, drag force. And we've talked extensively about one could model that. But we're going to take a very simple approach here. We're going to say, well, let's take simply the dynamic pressure. So we'll, we'll take simply a normalization of the classical uh, drag force, if you will, and we'll say that this is good enough. We'll put the coefficient times some uh, times the density of the fluid times the velocity squared times the cross-sectional area of the droplet, so times an R squared. That's going to be our estimate of, the, um, of, of that force. And then we'll divide by the mass of the droplet. So all this will write uh, divided by the mass. That will give us a division by the, dam the uh, <coughs> density of the droplet times something that scales with R cubed. I'll cancel the R squared from up there with the um, R squared from down there, and I end up with this. I place a coefficient in front of it to account for the fact that you know, this is a model um, for, for our problem. So that's my aerodynamic force. The spring, well, conceptually, this is really here to try to mimic the effect of surface tension bringing the drop back together. So that should be a measure of the surface tension uh, uh, stabilization. So dimensionally speaking, we can form uh, from the, uh, the surface tension uh, a, a response that is simply proportional to sigma, the surface tension coefficient, uh, and that has the dimensions of a spring uh, uh, coefficient divided by the mass. So the division by the mass is still a row of the droplet times r cubed times the coefficient that we're going to uh, ignore for now. Uh, really, sigma has already the units of a, of a spring coefficient. So, so we're, we're essentially, it's already a Newton per, uh, per, per line length of uh, interface, so we're already ready to go. So that's going to give us an um, expression for our spring. We're going to put a coefficient again to acknowledge that this is not an exact relation and it will require some tuning. The damper, well, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to now say that the only or the, the most natural damping uh, process was associated with the droplet would be the action of uh, viscous dissipation due to any induced flow inside the droplet. So I would need some damping proportional to the viscosity of the fluid that constitutes the droplet. And that would give me, uh, dimensionally speaking, uh, this needs to be multiplied by the um, by uh, um, a second time derivative of the velocity. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, derivative of the position. So that's multiplied by velocity. I need an extra length scale up there that I will divide with the uh, length scale coming from the mass here, and that gives me this expression. Again, with a coefficient, uh, a tunable coefficient, and then I need to have some reasonable decision for when a drop is deformed enough, enough that it should break. Well, it's not too complicated to think about. We have a linear model for how much we're stretching our droplet. Once the stretching gets on the order of the size of the droplet, we should expect that the drop breaks. What on the order means is up to a coefficient. So we'll leave that uh, to be determined later, later. So we can rewrite that in terms, oops in terms of this um, uh, normalized stretching and say that if this x divided by that coefficient times r is uh, larger than 1, then the drop breaks. So that's going to be our breakup criterion for our model. If we go back a few slides and look at this sketch here, you can see that the fundamental dynamics controlling the response of a low Weber number drop is based on the mode 2 oscillation. So we talked about that when we played with our droplet uh, yesterday. You could see that the oscillation survived longer with the mode 2 oscillation than it did with the mode 5 oscillation we played with uh, yesterday afternoon. So that's not too much of a surprise because effectively the uh, surface tension 
uh, becomes larger if you go to higher modes uh, of deformation because your local curvature is higher. So it makes sense that, uh, that the lowest mode would be the, the one that gives rise to the least stabilization by surface tension. And so we're going to go after this uh, N2, uh, N is equal to 2 mode, uh, this uh, dumbbell type mode for this model. Professor, yes? Why is the typical range of CB? Of C? For CB? Yeah. C, y is equal to X plus yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll provide values for this. Okay. So you can solve this. It's an easy equation to solve. Uh, the solution looks like this uh, little bit of a mess in which I've uh, used only non dimensional quantities. You can see all over, we're not forgetting all, all the coefficients that we set. They're still showing up here. The Weber number shows up. We have an inverse of a time scale associated with the viscous dissipation. And then we have an overall uh, oscillation uh, dynamic, uh, or uh, uh, a, uh, an oscillatory response of our solution that, uh, yeah, that you can see here, cos omega t, sine omega t, where this uh, omega is defined as the square root of this entire thing. What is this? Well, that takes us back, that gives us back naturally this, uh, this capillary time scale that we wrote uh, for low Weber numbers. So that's our expected capillary time scale, and that's a correction to account for the, uh, the role of viscosity. All right. So this model really looks at the low Weber number. It says, let's model it. Let's try to account for those physics. To finish the story, we still need to provide those four coefficients. Um, and this, essentially, you can get from experiments, you can get from observations, you can get from uh, a simple analysis. First of all, I told you that the critical Weber number at which we start observing breakup uh, is characterized by a value of 12 if the Weber number is based on the diameter. If you base the Weber number on the radius, then the critical value is approximately 6. Well, if we look at when our breakup happens, well, our breakup happens uh, as soon as this y value, that, uh, this non dimensional. Uh, deformation based on y of t here. As soon as this becomes larger than 1, you see breakup. So you can solve for this. If you make a few assumptions, neglect viscosity, start from a, a droplet rest, you find that the uh, onset of breakup is controlled for us by the product of the, this breakup coefficient, this force coefficient, and the spring coefficient. Well, the product of these two divided by this, okay? So three of our four parameters uh, are combined in telling us when the model will predict breakup. And this we want to calibrate based on experimental observations that breakup should happen around 12. So that gives us one relation that we can work with already. And we can continue with this approach. First of all, what we looked at yesterday, this drop that we deformed and we let oscillate. Well, interestingly enough, there are exact solutions for this. Uh, Lamb, back in 45, uh, derived the inviscid solution to that problem, and he predicted what the period of oscillation would be. And he did that for any mode, provided the deformation was small. So not what we looked at yesterday. We had a major deformation. But if the deformation, the amplitude of that deformation is small compared to the radius, then you can analytically solve this problem. And this is the uh, solution obtained by Lamb. We can look at what is our omega from the model, plug in sorry, the assumption that uh, the mode that we're interested in is uh, 2, okay, that we only want this, uh, this uh, elliptic oscillation of the droplet. And from that, that forces your spring coefficient to be equal to 8. So that controls your spring coefficient fully. Okay, so this to match oscillation periods. Now, there's one more coefficient you need to set, and that's the, uh, this, uh, the, the CD, the, the coefficient we use for damping. Uh, well, Lamb also solved in a linearized situation the case of a damped oscillation. So if you have the action of, uh, of uh, viscosity, you can figure out uh, so since Lamb solved for the entire problem, he had the, flu the full flow field inside and he could measure the, uh, 
the dissipation caused by this flow field uh, via the action of viscosity. So it provides a value for the characteristic time scale that it takes for that oscillation to die out completely. And that's that time scale here, again, from the same solution. And that allows us to directly set what our CD should be. Okay, so those two are not from experiments, they're from uh, analytical solutions for uh, a spherical drop. Now, the CB, the question that you were asking before, uh, what do you do with CB? Well, now we have this weird linear model for a full 3D deformed droplet. It's difficult to really do anything except say, well, I want something on the order of one. You can do some geometry and look at the mass associated with the dumbbell shaped. Uh, objects and argue that really a coefficient that would make sense is one half. And that's, that's essentially uh, how we're going to bring this to a close. We're going to say that as soon as the deformation, uh, as soon as there's deformation by half the radius of the droplet, uh, th that should be sufficient to lead to, to, to a pinch off and, and separation into two blobs. So you can plug all this uh, into our first relation, and that, will, and that tells us that to get from all these coefficients to get the right um, uh, critical Weber number, we need to set this, uh, this uh, force coefficient to one third. So that gives us, for an initially static drop, that gives us this solution now. So here's the, uh, the pretty cool thing. There's no surprise that the time for breakup for the low Weber number range of parameters should be well predicted by this. We build the model to give us a single capillary oscillation of this drop, so it should match uh, uh, well our results. So if you analyze at low Weber numbers the behavior of this model and you look at the time, sc the response, uh, uh, the time scale at which the system responds, this matches well that matches expected capillary dynamics at low Weber. And by low, I mean you know, 10 to 100. The pretty exciting thing is that this model also naturally transitions to giving you a time scale that matches with the kelvin elmos or shear based time scale at high Weber numbers. So that's the more surprising thing. So this is just taking, how do you get this, you, this, uh, this time to break up? You take this with all the parameters we have and you, you look at when that solution gives you y larger than one, that's it. So you just look at this oscillation that grows over time and you look at when you go past this, this y is equal to 1, at which we uh, uh, assign breakup. Well, the oscillation time for our system is the capillary time scale. We set it to be that. It will remain that. But that capillary time scale is the amount of time it takes you to break at low Weber numbers. So essentially, you have on the order of one oscillation, and then things break. At high Weber numbers, you find that you need many of those oscillations to, for breakup to happen, such that you ultimately see breakup controlled from the, uh, or let's say the number of oscillations becomes, uh, is not what matters anymore. Your, your, your profile hits this y is equal to 1 uh, on a different time scale. So that ends up matching the expected. Shear controlled dynamics at high Weber. So that's pretty exciting. We base the model on the low Weber number dynamics. We get an answer that matches with our observed and expected dynamics at high Weber numbers.
Uh, there's one piece that's missing with all this. This model at this point is capable of telling us when a drop breaks. So you plug in the velocity, the drop size, surface tension, uh, and from the local conditions, you'll have an answer that is, this is the time to break up. Break up doesn't mean, you know, it's a very general concept, uh, and you need to say what it means. A model kind of inherently suggests that the time to break up is a time to break up in two because of the way we've been thinking about our oscillations. But uh, this is not compatible. This is certainly uh, compatible with a very low Weber number response, but it's not compatible with the entire uh, regime of Weber numbers uh, above a Weber number of 12, essentially. So we need to allow for breakup into multiple drops. The argument that's uh, involved in the TAP model is an energy conservation argument. You look at the energy associated, so both the kinetic energy and the, the, the surface energy associated with the, uh, the single drop that you have, and you ask yourself, well, what is the amount, so upon breaking my system, what is the amount of energy that becomes available if I reduce the radius of my droplets into a collection of smaller radii? Okay, so if I take one droplet and replace it by several smaller droplets, first of all, I need to conserve mass. That tells me one condition uh, on uh, <coughs> how many of those drops I have. And then I have a second condition on, uh, uh, that is set here on the conservation of the energy in the system. And that gives me my, my second, uh, uh, a second condition that allows me to say something about the radius. This R32 here, we talked about that when we were talking about uh, drop size distributions. Uh, this is the sodomine radius. So this is the, the, uh, the, the uh, mass in the system, or the average mass over the, average, uh, over the total surface area. So SMD, well, SMR really, solder mean. radius. Okay, uh, and then from that you can work out how many drops um, have to be generated and you find, uh, no, sorry not how many drops, but uh, you find how many, uh, 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 you can take this in the limit of high Weber or low Weber is what I'm trying to say. Uh, at low Weber numbers you find that you have a fixed, a constant uh, child uh, droplet size. For high Weber numbers, the size of the drop depends on the, how large the Weber, the Weber number is. So from this, you need to know how many of those drops are generated, but that's easy, that's mass conservation. And then the question is, what, so that's a mean radius. Uh, in order to obtain that mean radius, you can sample randomly from a PDF, you could sample from a log normal PDF, that has this mean, uh, what's, um, you know, people sample from a, a chi-squared, from log normal, from a Roslin, is it Ramler uh, distribution, the type of uh, uh, drop size distributions that were, that, that we've discussed already. Okay, so you know how long it takes to break up, and based on your local conditions, you know also what should be the average size of the, uh, the children drops. You can, from mass conservation, obtain how many of them you need. You can just directly draw from a, from a typical PDF for those small sizes, and there you go, you have a breakup model. So this is a tunable drop breakup model. Tunable because in practice we set our coefficients based on reasonable arguments. But if you use this model without tuning the coefficients, you'll find that the performance will not be particularly good. So if you have experimental data that you can tune with, uh, you can adjust your coefficients and get pretty good performance with this. 
So that's one approach. We'll discuss a second approach uh, proposed by uh, Wolf Reitz at uh, University of um, uh, um, Wisconsin Medicine. It's called the wave model. It takes the exact opposite approach, and again, apologies again about this, uh, uh, the resolution. Um, it takes the complete opposite approach. It says, well, the tab model goes after the development of uh, representation that tries to emulate what's going on right here, and then, then it tries to push it to high Weber numbers. How about we build a model that emulates what's going on right here and see then how it works. The starting point uh, is to observe that uh, predicting or, or solving in any analytical sense the uh, wave dynamics and the Kelvin Amos wave dynamics in particular at the surface of a droplet is tough. However, saying something concrete about uh, the Kelvin Amos instability at the surface of a, uh, of a round liquid jet, that's doable. In fact, in fact it's been done. Uh, there's a number of uh, papers out there. There's, been, uh, there's a book by uh, C.C. Lin on, on the, um, the stability of, uh, of uh, liquid jets. There's um, a PhD th thesis from Germany from uh, uh, Mayer in 93 that looks at this, that explains a little bit of German here. So there's, there's quite a bit of work that's been done over the years in building a full viscous uh, linearized model of the uh, stability of a liquid column. So instead of analyzing a drop, we're going to analyze a round uh, uh, cylinder of, uh, of liquid. This can be done analytically. So I'm not going to go through that, especially because it's on. But this is the same thing as we did for, uh, that we did, uh, at least that uh, for which I gave you some notes on the Rayleigh plateau instability. A liquid column, you have a flow around it. What is the consequence? What are the waves that develop? So we discussed that briefly, and, and, and I gave you some notes on this. The only difference here, well, only is not, a, I don't want to downplay it. The main difference is that this is a solution to that problem. While in, in our notes, we had an inviscid solution. So you can solve all this. You have, again, you'll generate a dispersion relation, and you can look at what is the most unstable mode. And that looks like this. This is the, the, um, the growth rate. of a disturbance at the surface. Uh, disturbance, there we go, as a function of the wavelength of the disturbance. And this is with a rho gas that increases. This is in log scale. Uh, remember, uh, for the inviscid uh, uh, result, we had a nice bell-shaped curve that went to zero uh, at a certain value. Uh, we see the same thing here, but it's distorted because of the log scale. Uh, we have, so this is the, the region of unstable response of a wave. For all of these, so this, this is all done analytically. The interesting thing is that you can get from that what is the most unstable wavelength, and you can figure out what is the growth rate of that most unstable wavelength. Uh, from from this uh, from uh, from this model or from this uh, this uh, analytical solution, you can do the same thing for surface tension. So this is again growth rate, but this time for different surface tension fluids. You can look at the most unstable wavelength and look at the response uh, as a function of uh, surface tension. What uh, Wolfreitz did a good number of years ago was to point out, well, if we were to simply correlate those growth rates and uh, um, most unstable wavelength, then we have a pretty close model. If you give me the local conditions, I can tell you how a liquid column would become unstable most likely under those conditions. What would be the wavelength and how fast the waves would grow. And so that's what they did. Those are those correlations. There's really no value in us that he chose a number of parameters uh, in order to uh, to uh, to represent that but he has this optimal wavelength and he has this uh, growth rate for the instability so this is just a tabulation from the analytical or not tabulation I shouldn't say it's a tabulation it's a, it's a, a, 
a set of correlations from the analytical results. And so then you can plot that. Uh, this is the log of this wavelength. as a function of Weber number, and this is the uh, same thing, the log of this growth rate, and you can see the response as a function of, uh, of the Weber number for the flow locally. And so it has, it has this, uh, this data all nicely put together into simple expressions. From that, you can now start thinking about breakup and you can analyze this. this. So the first perspective was to say, well, now we have this liquid column, but we'll use those results as is in order to look at the stability, uh, in order to, to say something about a drop. So you're just going to in place say, my drop exposed to my local conditions will respond through the development of surface waves with a wavelength that's given by the same correlations and a, uh, a growth rate of, those, uh, of the sensibility given by the same uh, relation. You can obtain from that uh, like we've done before, a time for breakup. So how much growth of the wave is necessary in order to get a, a, uh, a, a detachment of a, of a structure. And then you can look at what that time for breakup is in low Weber numbers and high Weber number regi uh, regimes. So like exactly like we've done. So now we're using a high Weber number uh, uh, model and we're looking at how it works. It works obviously well in the high Weber number uh, regime. This was built based on the phenomenology of a Kelvin animal surface wave that strips away from the surface. It should work well, it does work well. Again, it's pretty exciting to see that even if you bring this back down to a low Weber number, you do recover the, uh, uh, an appropriate time scale for, uh, for capillary dom dominated breakup, even though the phenomenology is not the right one. And we're now saying the breakup happens through surface waves, and yet we do get back a, a, an equivalent time scale to the full, um, uh, uh, full drop oscillation. And that's pretty exciting again. So tab is a phenomenological model that says, Assume a drop goes boop, 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 boop. And you can get it to work well at low Weber numbers, and you can get it to also work well at high Weber numbers and predict appropriate uh, 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 outcomes from, uh, from your, your breakup. The wave model is a high Weber number model that naturally behaves in, uh, by stripping droplets from the surface at high Weber numbers. And somehow it also recovers the right behavior at low Weber numbers as well. Fundamentally, um, so one thing that I should have mentioned, so also you need to ask yourself, what is the characteristic uh, child drop sizes that are generated? The wave model just gives you the wavelength. You have the most unstable wavelengths uh, for the flow response. You'll say that that wavelength is what sets the drop uh, coming off. And in fact, you don't take the full wavelength. You say that there's a it would dip in a peak, this thing will form a ligament, and this will be the characteristic size of the, droplets, uh, of the droplet coming off. So about half of the wavelength is what you end up using for, uh, for a characteristic uh, radius. So anyway, this is, uh, the, the, this, is, uh, this is what this wave model will tell you in terms of the small drops. Fundamentally, there's some different behavior here. The tab model will tell you that you have an oscillation until the time of breakup, but at the time of breakup, you just get rid of your drop and you replace it by a collection of tiny droplets, of, of which we've computed the size. The wave model says that there's a sequence of surface waves, and each of them are allowed to grow until the time for breakup. When the, we reach the time for breakup, uh, we just take, the, uh, we take off a drop of that size, so we generate one drop. And then we continue uh, with the new next most unstable wave with the new drop condition. And that will take some time, reach breakup, and will form another drop. So the parent drop for the wave model with, will survive during the time integration of the model. And it will continuously shed tiny drops. So that's this idea of surface stripping. While this is 
Well, fine if you have two drops, right? If you break into your dumbbell into two, two drops, it mimics well the physics. Otherwise, this is a strange substitute for the stripping mechanism. It's just more akin to a sudden breakup of everything. Uh, I'll mention quickly here, uh, I think we're essentially at the end, so I'll just mention very quickly uh, that there's more models. There's a so-called DB model uh, that is an, essentially an extension of tab to say, okay, yes, you can do the simple oscillation of a drop, but it goes beyond by saying that you can also account for nonlinearities. For example, the change of the shape of the droplet changes the, uh, the uh, induced uh, force by the flow. So as the object changes shape, the flow field uh, experiences a different shape uh, object, and therefore it will uh, provide a different force on the, uh, on the object. So there's those nonlinear uh, coupling take place. Uh, you can also assign inertia to this extensional flow, so as this thing stretches out, it carries its own momentum. Uh, so there, there's a number of additional things that, uh, that we can do here um, to, to go a little bit beyond. I'm not going to talk about that in details. I just mentioned one thing, which is that when we were talking about <coughs> the, um, the catastrophic breakup, so remember we said once we go to really high vapor numbers, the liquid just, the gas just punches through the liquid droplet. Well, one way you can think about this is imagine the droplet flattens a bit, right, because of the high dynamic pressure of the gas. Um, you end up having essentially a flat surface of liquid with an incoming flow of gas, and this entire thing accelerates. Okay, it accelerates in the direction of the flow. But if you take this acceleration and were to recast it as a gravitational acceleration, what would really be happening is you would be looking at a liquid surface sitting on top of a gas layer, which we argued would, should be an unstable uh, configuration under the Rayleigh-Taylor instability. So you're accelerating heavy stuff into light stuff. That means that just, again, by, by, by treating, uh, uh, by thinking of, of this from an acceleration standpoint, this flow should be uh, unstable to the rayleigh Taylor instability. And so if we go back, right here, now we're saying that there's, it is reasonable for us to go after that term as well. In the situation where we just see this, this punching through type of behavior, um, provided that we don't take G, but the local flow acceleration. That's the idea behind this uh, really Taylor breakup model that was first proposed to look at uh, specifically this, uh, this uh, catastrophic breakup regime. So the idea is to say that when you look at those at uh, this uh, liquid region being punched through, well, it has a characteristic wavelength. It is reasonable to say that this should be, at least it's reasonable to test this against the, uh, the corresponding rated tater, a most unstable wavelength. So that's the idea behind this model. You can do the same thing then, do the same analysis. You have a characteristic wavelength that's the most unstable ra wavelength to the uh, um, uh, for the uh, relative instability, you can look at the time for breakup and all this. So this is um, uh, this is yet another model that's uh, that can be. I'll point out uh, a uh, an interesting and phenomenology agnostic model by. Uh, Apte, uh, Surap Apte is the one who, uh, who did the implementation. The uh, mastermind behind the model is uh, uh, Mikhail Gorokovsky. So Apte and Gorokovsky had this uh, publication back in 2003, I think, Atomization and Sprays, uh, wherein, so this is with M. Gorokovsky. They, um, the approach that uh, they used was to say, well, all those models are based on the same idea that there's some time to break up that's provided through a phenomenological consideration. That could be uh, a Kelvin-Amos wave, it could be a Rayleigh-Taylor 
instability, it could be a, um, a capillary instability. Right? Those are the three phenomena we've looked at. They say, well, let's just say that you give me a characteristic time to break up and you give me a, a characteristic distribution of drop sizes. They just formulated a, a phenomenology agnostic uh, stochastic model for after every characteristic uh, uh, breakup times, draw a new drop and say, my uh, parent drop now breaks into this uh, uh, children drop. So this is more of a fragmentation type model uh, that's based on essentially just uh, stochastic treatment of the problem. It still requires a TBU to be provided. So it still requires some sort of phenomenological uh, assumption, some sort of, some sort of statement saying, all right, I believe that what controls the breakup is going to be this phenomenon. All right, any questions? Yes. Won't the uh, breakup for a jet be different from that, uh, that from a droplet? Yes. Uh, yes, but uh, uh, I guess Wolf Reitz was uh, pragmatic by just saying that he had closed form solutions for the jet, but not for the droplet. And so, but in the same way, right, the, 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 the true dynamical response of a droplet, even modeled as a spring, is different from a 1D spring. So those are models, right, the, the engineering models, they're not they're not, uh, they have no, no claim at being analytic, analytical uh, in any way. So uh, I'll go a bit uh, quicker on this because I also want to talk about uh, spray uh, from a higher perspective. So we'll jump to collisions, uh, collision and coalescence. Uh, we'll do a bit of the same, but uh, I'll try to go a bit faster. First of all, so we talked about this already last week, so I don't want to go through this again. Uh, we talked about particle wall collisions. Uh, particle particle collisions and things like this. So, we discussed those concepts. Uh, one thing we didn't talk about is the concept of wall roughness. So, I thought I would just point out a little uh, uh, observation on this that the models we've discussed so far, I guess we'll change color somehow, um, can be modified to include the effect of non spherical particles cause of the effect of rough, uh, rough walls. So if you have a non-spherical particle, the bouncing of that particle, of that, so we're not doing liquid droplets here, we're just saying a hot particle will be modified. Depending on how the particle hits, uh, you'll have a, a, a random element to the collision process. And so there, there's models that have been used for this. So I, I won't say more on this. As far as the, the roughness is concerned, if you know the length scale of the roughness, if you know something about the height, the length scale of the, pro, uh, of the roughness, you can model it pretty easily in the context of what we've done by simply tilting the local normal orientation of our wall. So you would treat the collision in the same way as we've treated the collision for a particle hitting the wall last uh, Friday, or, yeah, Friday, I think. So you can do the same thing, but then you would say that locally, in fact, the wall is not flat like this, but it has this orientation. And that would certainly make you bounce in other ways. And then the way you get this, this plane orientation could be simply by sampling from a Gaussian distribution uh, that uh, represents, in a reasonable way, the, the local roughness of the surface. So people have looked at that. Uh, one of the main references here would be um, Martin Sommerfeld, who has, uh, has developed model, models like this, uh, is mostly an experimentalist, but he has, he has, used, uh, he has developed wool roughness models uh, for particle and flow simulations. And there's a, another reference here from uh, Shen et al, uh, 89, so pretty old stuff that shows the random 
uh, response of a uh, the random collisional response of a particle hitting a, uh, a flat surface. I'm not going to bug you more uh, about this. Let's talk now about droplets. So we're going to be interested in droplets hitting walls. Um, first of all, you can characterize what's going on uh, under a number of different conditions. There's one interesting thing we can talk about briefly, which is the situation where you have a hot wall. If the wall is hot, there's going to be some interesting extra physics uh, related to the vaporization of your liquid at the contact with the wall. So uh, you'll find that, so this is the Weber number of the incoming droplet, okay, so the drop in, uh, is incoming, hits the wall, and then you see what is happening after the uh, contact with the wall. So let me sketch this. I have a wall, and the droplet incoming with a characterized Weber number. And then the question is, what comes out? Watchers in the, uh, watchers in the uh, Westerling looked at this question from a, an experimental perspective and pointed out that for very slow impacts, the droplet will actually bounce. So it will deform, it will not wet the wall, and it will move out. So it will come out with a Weber number that's very close to the incoming Weber number. So this is the linear, um, this is the uh, Weber out equal to Weber in line, which corresponds to a perfectly elastic rebound. There's going to be a response that will be non-trivial uh, that will involve the fact that as the drop hits, it deforms. Uh, there's a vapor film being created underneath it, and so it creates a cushion over which the, the droplet bounces. And so the response is going to be pretty complex. There's more and more dissipation happening as the drop deforms more and more. And so we have more and more of an inelastic response until we get to this catastro well, catastrophic or very uh, dr drastic change wherein we see either wetting or we see so the drop impact is large enough that either the drop wets and forms a film or uh, 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 breaks and splashes in such a way that you don't have a, an outgoing drop. So the process of a drop hitting a wall as modeled as well uh, using similar approaches to what we've discussed before. And so I'm not going to go through the details and let you look at that. There's an important, uh, um, uh, the reference here is uh, Watkins and Wang from 90. Um, th this is the characteristic or critical number about equal to 80 that controls whether a drop will hit a wall and leave that wall uh, with a reasonable level of integrity, so basically leaving as a, a single drop versus splashing into a large collection of drops. So based on this observation, you can now formulate a model where on the left, you just do something like specular reflection. You fix it to actually acknowledge that there's some losses and, and things need to be modified. But the important thing here is that you leave with a single drop. So n is the number of outgoing drops. Once you go above 80, uh, this model just says, will create a whole bunch of, uh, you know, will we'll, we'll have some, some impact that will lead to breakup into some number, and this, is, uh, this was set to 27 for some reason. I don't know enough about the details of this model, uh, but this falls just from the diameter of the outgoing drop, essentially. Once you do this, you say that the normal velocity upon this, the, uh, upon this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, failure uh, uh, from surface tension in keeping the drop together well, what happens is the, the spring aspect of the drop fails. It doesn't respond. It doesn't uh, give you this recovery phase of the drop leaving the wall. 
And so you end up with a distribution of tangential velocities for your droplets, but no uh, normal velocity away from the wall. So this is a splash followed by a bunch of droplets that slide along the wall. You can continue with this and think instead, uh, so try to do a better job. So this is here on the left. So this model is elastic on the left and splash on the right. You can fix this to some extent by saying, well, look, elastic is not right. This is certainly not elastic. We're below the Weber out is equal to Weber in uh, curve uh, that is right here. So this is specular reflection. We need something that's less than specular reflection. So Park in 94 provided that. He went essentially to the experimental data to say that we should leave with a reduced velocity so you accounted essentially for the dissipation uh, through the, uh, the collision. And then you acknowledge that this idea of going from one drop to suddenly a bunch of three times smaller drops, for some reason, it's not particularly convincing. Uh, and so what he did in the, instead is looked at what would happen if you, had, if you use a, a film type of understanding to set what's really happening. So he looked at the amount of incoming energy for the droplets. So I, I'm not going to go through this. I'm just going to explain that as you know how much inertia ha the drop has coming in, and you know what is the effect of surface tension keeping it together. The question is how thin of a film as, are you going to form as the drop splashes? So you give, give it its initial impulse, and you see how far it can go and how flat it can get before su surface tension can arrest this entire thing. And once you have the solution, you have an idea for what the characteristic height for that uh, film uh, is. Um, and so, uh, let me uh, go here. So you have so you have more information uh, from that. You can say, well, different things can happen as a function of the Weber number, but essentially, you would expect droplets on the scale of that film size uh, to be generated. Uh, you can try to correlate that to experiments. Uh, the way the droplet trajectory is spread tangentially is also something that can be correlated from experiments. And then the amount of vertical rebound is also something that can be obtained from experiments. There's a lot of information, in particular, on the topic of what, what type of uh, um, uh, 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 on the topic of milk crowns. So how do uh, small droplets emanated from craters? So this is what you would call a milk crown. Uh, there's a lot of statistics regarding how big and how fast those, moving, those uh, droplets are moving in the normal direction. Whoops. So Park brought all this together in an attempt to, uh, to, uh, to mimic a splash beyond just saying, hey, let's put 27 droplets. So the, if you have a reason to think that your spray or your droplets are going to hit a wall, there are, there are models, there are uh, ideas that have been used uh, in the past. Ultimately, uh, so I have a few more references here, including in particular one from uh, one more from uh, from Wolf Fritz. Typically, the same type of models have been used to what we've discussed before. You look at the amount of energy, and you look at the dissipation of that energy through the action of the forces that you know happen. Uh, you go reach out to uh, uh, standard uh, size distribution functions for your droplets, things like that, or you try to correlate to either uh, direct numerical simulations or experiments in order to, uh, to uh, set your phenomenological uh, impact model. So those are the overall ideas. Uh, I'll leave you with, uh, on that topic, with the um, observation that, depending on the conditions, it might be very necessary to solve an extra equation of parabolic nature that describes the amount of liquid in the film at the surface. 
it is probably infeasible if you're solving, say, a, a gas turbine combustion chamber uh, using a CFD model to actually resolve the thickness of a film and to use a level set type of method to, to track this, uh, this film at the surface of your wall. But you could track a variable that tells you what is the height of the liquid film by just vertically integrating your, uh, your equations uh, from the wall. So there's models like this that exist. Uh, there's one that was uh, worked on and published in, uh, uh, by, uh, uh, what's his name, um, Herman. And um, so tell you. And that was, uh, I'm not sure exactly when, in fact, that's, I need to check that. But uh, if you search Herman and Soteriu, you'll find such a model uh, uh, being used for a, a gas turbine combustion chamber um, um, uh, simulation. As soon as you have higher viscosity, or non-Newtonian phenomena, things become crazy complicated. So if you're more on the chemical engineering side of things, working with more esoteric uh, fluids, uh, you know, this type of thing can happen. This is the outcome of a, uh, so this is a, a water glycerin droplet impacting a, an ethanol uh, film. You create a splash. What this is, is the outer wall of the crater that's being created. And you can see that this looks more like a spider web than anything else with lots of tiny droplets. But because of the high viscosity of the system, we have uh, 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 liquid ligaments that are able to be sustained and maintained for very, very long, uh, long uh, uh, significant elongation. And that gives very crazy patterns. So uh, if you're interested in the, in the drop sizes coming out of more esoteric mixtures upon impacting, so you know, multi-component uh, uh, impact problems become amazingly complicated. Well, add to this a quick discussion on drop-drop interactions. So we've talked about drop-wall interaction if you have a drop hitting a, a droplet, uh, that can lead to some interesting physics. If you're looking at combustion problems, typically that's not going to matter. Typically the situation is that you are mostly breaking your liquid into smaller droplets. You're not looking at the recommendation of that, look, uh, that liquid into, uh, into larger drops. Uh, but if you're looking at other processes, for example, rain formation, well, drop-drop interactions, is one of the key processes by which the uh, rain droplets increase in size. And so those collisions matter, and the outcome of those collisions matter. Um, one, uh, uh, a couple of uh, 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 subtle points. Um, first of all, coalescence is tricky. You cannot have two drops. You need actual impact. And not only do you need impact, but you need impact with enough inertia to overcome the draining of the gas film that separates the two, uh, the, the two droplets. And that ultimately means that you need to, be, to have enough inertia in your collision to bring your two liquid films very close. And very close means on the order of about 100 angstroms. That's, where, that's how close you need to, to be for the van der Waals forces to start to dominate, take over, and change the local topology of the interface. Again, the same way that we argued that breakup is not something that's contained in our navier stokes equation uh, by default, a coalescence event is not something that's contained in our navier stokes equations by default. So there's a modeling step here that, uh, that involves the molecular scales and needs to be brought to the, to the macroscopic scale. If you're looking at a um, at drop-drop collision from the perspective of Lagrangian like, particle tracking, um, then it essentially takes us back to the question of collision modeling. It takes us back to the question of deciding whether the drop is getting uh, to occupy the same location. And so we talked about hot sphere models, half sphere models. The same type of detection 
uh, ideas would be used to determine whether, I, whether the drops are getting into contact. If you have now a Eulerian approach to modeling your, your, uh, your particles, uh, again, based on what we were talking about last week, if, you have, if you're solving for a, a particle number density and a mean particle velocity, you have given up on any two particle distribution information. You don't have any information regarding the probability of having a pair of particles separated by any distance. You have a single particle uh, distribution function, and therefore you have to fully model your, uh, the outcome of a collision. I'll just show um, quickly what is, uh, it turns out that there's a lot that's been figured out regarding what is the outcome of drop-drop uh, collisions. The main work here, I don't know why, uh, oh no, it's right here. So from uh, Chen and Law, uh, a 97 JFM, showed, uh, was the earliest paper to show a very comprehensive regime diagram or regime map of the outcome of drop-drop collisions. This, uh, this is a two-parameter regime map. Again, the important parameter is still it's centrally a Weber number. The question is, what is the amount of inertia that you have in the collision, so coming from both drops, uh, compared to the surface tension that will first prevent your drops from uh, merging, but will then also uh, characterize the amount of further deformation that, that can take place uh, after the collision has taken place. Uh, there's one more parameter considered here, and that's the, um, the uh, uh, off-center parameter. So instead of doing pure head-on collisions that are not particularly realistic, uh, Chen and Law looked at what happens as you offset the collision by some amount. So that axis here is the head-on collision. As you move up, you'll get to a point where the separation, this normalized separation, uh, once it gets to one, the drops are missing one another, right? So there's this, this, um, you go from, from grazing collisions to, to head-on collisions. And so this is the, uh, the, uh, the, the phenomenology here. Uh, you have different outcomes. The interesting uh, systematic outcome at very low Weber numbers is that you don't have enough inertia in the collision, so in, in, in the sum of the, uh, the, those, uh, in the, in the, the, that relative velocity, you do not have enough inertia in order to fully drain the gas film that exists between the two droplets. And that means that you never bring the two interfaces close enough to have a topology change. And, um, well, in fact, I'm sorry, this is, uh, the, this is the second region here. Uh, and you have this entire uh, low Weber number regime here where, where you have a bouncing behavior. I'll explain why we have the other one. So this is, by bouncing, that means no coalescence. It's characterized by the fact that you have not enough inertia, as well as not enough time to drain the gas film between the drops. The reason why even lower Weber numbers do show coalescence is because, yes, you have less inertia, but you have more time. If you reduce the relative velocity, you'll end up having more time to be able to drain your film. So this is not a linear process. Uh, in that situation here, there is enough time to drain the gas film, and as a result, the drops merge. Bouncing becomes more uh, systematic, even for high Weber numbers, provided you get closer to grazing uh, conditions. That's to be expected. This is just due to the fact that the relative velocity between the interfaces, as you move from the head-on uh, head collision to the off-center collision as, is reducing. So the relative velocity reduces, therefore there's more 
of a tendency to bounce. Uh, then the, the outcome is again coalescence as you keep creeping up the Weber number. And then as you go up here for the head-on behavior, uh, after coalescence, so this is, here you have enough inertia to uh, drain the film, to overcome the film. Uh, if you put more inertia to this, there's so much inertia that after the oscillation, the drop just re-separates. So there's coalescence followed by separation. Turns out that if you have a sufficiently off-center behavior, there's going to be a significant amount of straining of the droplet that would take place, and it will be easier and a more natural outcome for the droplets to re-separate, even if, they, if they've coalesced. So let's look at a few uh, versions of that, uh, a few images of this. So this is the uh, very low-speed collision. Two drops getting in, in contact, but you can see they're staying in contact for a long time until at some point the film has been drained, the contact between the two interfaces has been made, and now surface tension brings those two drops together into a single drop. Okay, this is just uh, a pretty simple process. If you go a little bit faster, you don't give yourself enough time, and the particles end up, the droplets end up re-separating without coalescing. This CFD of this is easy. Place two drops, uh, throw them slowly against one another, all fine, you get the right results. CFD of this is hard, like really hard, because now if we zoom in right here, this is what we have. We have a drop. Uh, uh, here and the drop there, and this separation, this distance here, is on the order of fractions of microns. It could be uh, uh, two, three, four hundred uh, angstroms. So this is tough. Uh, this is a, 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 a tough problem from the perspective of CFD. As soon as we get to higher uh, um, relative velocities, things become easy for CFD again. Now we have um, significantly more inertia dominated flow. We throw a drop at one another, they hit one another, the film drains quickly, the gas film drains quickly, the drops merge, uh, and then they, they kind of do their thing. You can see that as you keep in, uh, increasing the relative velocity, after the drops merge, they start oscillating, and upon oscillation, you almost are able to separate them. Uh, and so you can see that the amount of, of inertia imparted to the motion needs, uh, leads ultimately uh, is bound to lead to, uh, to further breakup and re-separation. So that's what's shown here in the next slide. Uh, you throw the drops at one another even faster. Now you have enough uh, inertia left and right that this separates into two drops again. The outcome can be varied. Now we're looking at the formation of a ligament. As you keep going faster, you're forming ligaments. So ligaments is unstable to the Rayleigh plateau instability. That means that any type of disruption along this thin cylinder will lead to <coughs> rapid breakup. Well, the question is, what is the characteristic length scale of this? Well, we said it should be a few times the diameter, and so if this ligament is formed, as if this ligament is stretched long enough, we won't get the we, we can get multiple droplets out of this, and so that's in fact what's going on here, where you break a satellite drop right in the middle. So this is a perfect uh, example of Rayleigh plateau. And then, let me see, where am I? Here, okay. Wait, is that twice the same? Okay, so I guess I have twice, twice the same slide. So moving on to forward, uh, we can look at what happens if, as we go further off-center. And if you go further off-center, 
you can start to see this interesting physics where if you were on center, you would have enough inertia to further break and separate the drops. But if you're off center, you transfer quite a bit of your momentum into this rotational uh, dynamics. And so you see this drop kind of spinning around itself and it ends up re-stabilizing it and preventing further breakup. And if you keep going further off center, then you have kind of this glancing collision uh, that, uh, that leads to merging between the two drops, but then you still form a ligament that can break. So the outcome is non-trivially dependent on the, uh, the off-center uh, separation. All those cases are pretty easy to handle from the perspective of CFD. If you want to do interface tracking type of methods or interface capturing type of methods for this, uh, that will work well. And ultimately, this is even more of center where you create very long ligaments and you can see that now we have this long thing here. Again, Rayleigh Plateau will control the dynamics of that and you can see that we're creating a bunch of uh, like one, two, three, four, five drops or something like this. And if you go further off center, now you've reduced the relative velocity between your, your two uh, interfaces and you're back to the situation where you can't drain film uh, of gas and you end up having the drops just bouncing on one another. Modeling standpoint, uh, in the interest of time, and just point out quickly, you can approximate the regime diagram um, that we looked at. You, look, you, you say you have a Lagrangian representation of your droplets. You detect impact through your collision model. Once you know impact, you look at the off-center, uh, uh, the amount of off the offset be, uh, between the two particles, and you look at uh, and you take their local Weber number. From that, you go seek out the outcome from the regime diagram, and you replace your drop by the result of the collision. So either a single drop or uh, potentially uh, two drops if they re-separate, or potentially two smaller drops with one uh, extra child. And I'll re-highlight here what I said before, DNS for a number of those problems. Every time you get into a situation where uh, you have a long-lived gas film, DNS type of approaches, so the phase interface tracking type of methods, will struggle because the length scale for that film is dra drastically smaller than all the relevant length scales of the droplets, of the inertia on the system, and all this. So those are difficult problems. They're, they're reasonably easy problems to do experimentally. They can be very tough problems to do computationally. So it's a true, really a, a true multi-scale challenge. All right, I'll stop here. This doesn't work. Any questions on this while uh, I jump to the last document? So the last document, I'll let you uh, read some of that, but the focus here is more on the general discussion on, on, on uh, spray formation. So the topic is liquid atomization. I have a few references. Um, we'll talk a bit about, oops, we'll talk a bit about this one. We'll talk quite a bit about this one. This is a, an interesting textbook that, um, um, has uh, uh, there's been more of an engineering, uh, 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 a good uh, engineering guidance, let's say, uh, on the topic of atomization. So we'll start with a discussion of primary versus secondary atomization. So let's spend first some time looking at this very cartoonish perspective of atomization. So now. I'm not worried about a droplet breaking anymore, or at least I'm not worrying about a single one. I'm, I care about how a coherent stream of liquid, maybe a liquid jet, can turn into a spray. Well, this dilute spray is typically what I want. If I want to do painting, that's what I want. If I want to do, um, if I want to, um, 
um, generate an aerosol for uh, medical purposes, this is what I want. If I want to form a fuel spray that will then evaporate, my goal is to minimize the to maximize the surface area, therefore minimize the diameter of those droplets so that the evaporation is as fast as possible. Again, this is what I want. The question is what characterizes and controls and limits the process by which I'll go from a single liquid jet to this collection of droplets. So what is this problem about? This problem is about creating surface area. This uh, an, a potential energy associated with that, right? Sigma times the sum, the total surface area of the, um, of the droplets is my surface energy. The total surface area here as I come in is low. When I leave here with my spread is high. So I need to give, um, we're trying here to maximize the surface energy of our liquid. Uh, how do we do this? Well, we need to impart energy to the system by either providing a lot of kinetic energy to our liquid, so we accelerate our liquid, and then the hope is that this kinetic energy will be transform transformed into surface energy. Or alternatively, you could accelerate um, the surrounding gas in the hope of, uh, of uh, creating, uh, again, a, a, a significant amount of surface area. In any case, the way this is going to work uh, can be thought out like this. The, the untouched, uh, unbroken region of your liquid, st liquid stream, we'll call that the liquid core. This is the region where atomization, this topology change phenomenon, has not yet reached. Um, outside of that, right outside of that, is the region where the main structures, uh, where this, this main liquid core is seeing structure being peeled off of it. Okay, so there's going to be topology changes from the liquid core. Uh, uh, topology changes from the liquid core is what we're going to call primary atomization. I have this primary blob of liquid that is the central region of a jet, and I'm peeling stuff off from that. That uh, 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 first topology change from the main region, that's going to be my primary atomization. Once I have peeled off from the central core, I have now this blob of stuff that could be like a drop, that could be like a ligament, like a sheet. I have some topology of liquid stuff that's been, uh, uh, that's been removed from the liquid core, that's been carried away. This now, I can start to think more maybe uh, as a, a separate liquid drop. I have something like a blob of liquid that's being exposed to a complex flow field. And now I know already quite a bit, we've discussed about what happens to this based on the Weber number of it. So this break up of those detached structures into further small structures, we're going to refer to that as secondary atomization. So what we talked about during the first hour was essentially how one would model secondary atomization. Once I have a detached structure, how does it further break into tiny drops? Uh, So I can sketch it uh, right here again. You know, based on what we've argued, this is what this uh, would look like. Uh, I have this two-color representation. The region where the key primary atomization takes place is the blue one. The region where the, uh, the, the, the green region is the further detached structures that went through multiple breakup processes. So this is the first detachment. from the coherent liquid core. And this is the further breakup of detached liquid into droplets. I'll say that for this, we have many models. And we talked about some of them already. So many model, what am I writing? Many models. Although, I would also acknowledge that those models are phenomenological in nature. They don't truly encompass all the physics. They assume that there's one key physical process, one key phenomenology, and based on that, they generate some predictions.
Fe, no, me, no, lo, G call. For the primary atomization, this is where things are, are, are fairly problematic. Uh, there is essentially, well, I would say a handful, but even that, uh, there's probably a, a two finger full ensemble of models here. There's very little out there in terms of predicting this primary atomization region in, in terms of models. So I, I'll say just here virtually no model have been proposed for this. Uh, I'll, I'll mention one exception. There's a, a so-called ELSA model based on the so-called sigma y equations. which I, uh, is essentially using a combustion type of approach it's from a, a combustion uh, um, a scientist uh, called Borg. This is based on uh, an idea of, uh, of looking at, uh, 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 this is recycling flame surface density models into interface surface density models. Uh, so those are some uh, reference if you're interested. But What is going to matter? There's two fundamental things that are going to matter in that region. Turbulence and instabilities. The combination of these two things is what will lead to the original detachment of liquid structures. So, the interest of time, I, I'll, I'll go uh, uh, fairly quickly with this. Um, let me think. I think we'll... Uh, yeah, so we still have some time tomorrow morning to wrap this up. So I don't want to rush this because this is important. Yes, so there's, um, to the general question, what do uh, combustion codes do? They'll do typically one of two things. They will either um, directly know something from experiments or from uh, correlations or from uh, basically assumptions about what a reasonable drop size distribution might be from their injector. So they'll directly inject at or around the mean velocity that's given by the nozzle size and the uh, mass flow rate out of the nozzle and match the uh, and provide the droplet size distribution that matches with the specifications of the injector so they'll rely on ex the existence of data uh, and they'll directly populate so this you know this, uh, your typical combustion code will be running this with either so that dilute spray, spray will be with either Euler Lagrange or Euler Euler. Um, but in any case, there would need to be some information about the distribution and space of your spray, the initial velocity, and uh, and the size distribution. So yeah, either those informations are assumed in the sense that they're taken from measurements that are provided from some specifications of the nozzle. Or alternatively, the other approach that's, uh, that's used also is to rely on something like the tab breakup model all the way. So if you have a secondary breakup model, you could say, well, let me inject my fuel in a form of droplets. Let me say that I'm directly in droplets of the size of my liquid core. Uh, of the size of my nozzle diameter. And that's how I'm going to do the injection process. So I will say, I, instead of having a jet, I have a collection of big blobs that come in. And then I trust my secondary atomization model from the very beginning. I just trust it and assume that it's going to do primary atomization well. Uh, it doesn't. So you can, again, you're back to tuning parameters. If you have experimental data, you can tune this entire story to make some sense. If you don't have experimental data, uh, the breakup of a drop, the size of the nozzle diameter will be, hey, will be completely different 
uh, from the breakup of a droplet that's uh, you know fiftieth uh, of the uh, of the nozzle diameter. So. This is a big, big, big open question in terms of combustion modeling at this point. Uh, some of the methods we talked about already can be used to solve this from first principles, but at typically very high cost. So this is work in progress. Hopefully the next few years we'll see uh, enough progress made in this that we can answer this more conf confidently. Let me just, in the interest of time, I'll just uh, um, do just a bit of phenomenology and then we'll, we'll finish that up tomorrow morning um, or tomorrow afternoon, we'll see. We talked about the non-dimensional numbers of, of uh, relevance, so I don't need to say anything more on this. Those three non-dimensional groups are related with one another. We mentioned that already. This is the square root of the Weber number over the Reynolds number. But I would like to talk just for a minute about the so-called Onesorge chart, which was uh, <coughs> done as part of um, Onesorge's PhD thesis in uh, 1930. That's not new, although it's been worked on continuously by people, including again Wolf Reitz from uh, University of uh, Wisconsin Madison, um, Lefebvre, uh, Mises. There's a, a few other people who've worked on uh, improving the, char the, the, the characterization of uh, this breakup process. So those regime shots are interested in the question of what happens to a round liquid jet issued in quiescent gas. So we've looked at regime diagrams for drops hitting one another. We've looked at regime diagrams or at least phenomenological classification, what happens to a suddenly accelerated drop. Well now we're asking ourselves what happens as I just flow a round liquid jet uh, out of a nozzle into quiescent gas. The answer is right here. This chart shows the existence of multiple regions separated by different models. We're not going to go through the details in the interest of time, but this is characterized as a function of Onosauric and Reynolds. You can similarly replace this Onosauric by Weber, right? Because we said they're all connected. So the idea is to map viscosity, uh, inertia, surface tension, uh, and represents what is the outcome uh, of the flow. There's different categories depending on what's going on. If surface tension dominates, uh, um, or if surface tension dominates less, we'll see different responses. So let me just go through those terms uh, briefly. So the lowest velocity jet will be characterized by both a low Onesorge number and a low uh, Reynolds number. And that condition will have the most boring situation that's turning on your faucet. You'll have what's called Rayleigh breakup. So we talked about the Rayleigh plateau instability. This is what that is. This is surface tension controlled. This breakup, the breakup happens according to Rayleigh Plateau. We said that the resulting drop was on the order of, uh, I think the radius we said was nine, <coughs> nine times the, 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 uh, the radius of the, 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 uh, the, mo the unstable drop was nine times the diameter of this, uh, uh, this structure. So the drop generated is on the order of four times, I think 4.5 times the diameter. Okay, so you generate large drops because the instable, instable wave uh, um, just arises from this instability analysis we did. So that corresponds to a liquid Weber number that's small. Right? This has to be surface tension control, that means the Weber, num Weber number is small. <coughs> As you increase the, the Weber number a bit, you see a response that is a, a bit more exciting, but still not uh, too exciting. What you see is essentially single drops being emitted from the end of the jet. Uh, those drops, however, become smaller. They become smaller, and in fact, they start matching the diameter of the jet. Why is that? Well, it's because the Rayleigh plateau instability is enhanced. 
How is it enhanced? Well, it's enhanced by the fact that the, as you flow faster, the pressure uh, from outside, actually the dynamic pressure from the gas actually contributes to the destabilization of the liquid. So this is the so-called first wind-induced breakup. If this is my jet axis, and remember this is my instability, oops, this is my wave that's growing on this uh, surface. Now, if I place myself in the frame of reference attached to this wave, I now have my flow that's flowing around this growing wave. Well, if this flow goes fast enough, now it will contribute its own pressure distribution to the story. My flow of gas at the surface of the bulging area will go faster, I'll have a lower pressure, and therefore my, my uh, gas uh, from the action of pressure will be further sucking out my bulging uh, uh, region here in the, um, on, on my liquid. So what we're saying now is that the gas becomes an active player in this. While our Rayleigh plateau analysis was done essentially uh, without considering too much about what the gas was doing, if the gas starts playing a role, it will accentuate this instability. This is still fully Rene, uh, uh, this is still ST controlled. And this is essentially a situation where gas assists. Break up. There's a fundamental change as you keep pushing the velocity of the liquid jet. So as you keep increasing, increasing the VEBA number, uh, in particular once you get another order of magnitude uh, 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 larger, once you get into the VEBA number on the, order, the liquid VEBA number on the order of 20, now you switch completely perspective. The breakup is no longer going to be due to the Rayleigh plateau instability. Now the breakup is going to again transition to surface wave dynamics. So before, for our drop, we said our drop oscillates, this is capillary in nature, and then once we go to a high enough Weber number, uh, we start to see shearing at the surface. Well, this is the same transition. The instability for the uh, Rayleigh plateau and the first wind-induced condition, this was caused by surface tension. Without surface tension, those jets would be stable. Now we're going to get to a situation where surface tension is not going to be the cause, but shear at the surface is going to be the cause. In that situation, the wavelength is going to dramatically reduce, and as a result, surface tension will become stabilizing. No longer, it will no longer be destabilizing. So we go from a situation where surface tension facilitates to a situation where surface tension uh, uh, limits the, the breakup. So now this becomes controlled by Kelvin Helmholtz waves. So this is now shear driven. And this is now opposed by surface tension forces. As we keep going um, faster, as we keep cranking up the Weber number, the next thing that happens is that the liquid jet becomes turbulent. Those things are not decoupled. You can't accelerate the liquid jet without cranking up its Reynolds number. So at some point, the Reynolds number of the liquid jet is such that we transition to turbulence in the liquid. Once we're turbulent in the liquid, the story changes completely because now turbulence in the liquid means that I have a non-zero interface normal velocity right at the location of the interface. My flow will want to push the interface outward because of the presence of turbulent eddies within the liquid region. So now the action of turbulence itself is sufficient to fully disrupt the jet. From Lefebvre, from his textbook, 
if I can write, but I guess I can't. 1989. He, basic, uh, he, he basically says, I want to say from Lefebvre, he essentially argues that the mechanism is unknown. Why is that? Well, by mechanism, they mean an analytical and stability-based understanding of what's going on. Well, it's difficult to acquire if you're looking at a full uh, ensemble of uh, turbulent eddies that are pushing your liquid in all directions. So that's kind of the picture that uh, we're looking at. I will just, uh, let me show, let me scroll down a bit. Uh, I just want to show the corresponding images. This is your Rayleigh plateau. Okay, the jets just dripping little drops. Uh, this is the smaller drops that come from the first wind induced break up. You can see that the drops are forming on, well, you can see it's a little dark, but uh, the drops are forming on a smaller uh, scale. This is once you get to the second wind induced. It's not clear at all. There's a few pixels, it's blurry. If you zoom in, this is what you get. And now it becomes clear that you have the, su the succession of kelvin helmholtz surface waves. And this is not particularly clear, uh, but this just shows the, the main difference with the fully turbulent atomization is that because of the non-zero wall normal velocity or non-zero interface normal velocity in the turbulent flow field, the interface is disrupted from the very beginning. There's this region here of a very smooth interface that you can see right here. That's the time it takes for the instability to grow and develop. If you're in, turbul in the turbulent region, it becomes a mess from the very, very beginning. As soon as the liquid uh, leaves the nozzle, it, uh, it, uh, it becomes disrupted. Yes. So this is just liquid in in uh, in quiescent gas. Okay. Um, the uh, the main difference, if you look at liquid liquids or two, so if you're looking at an immiscible uh, two immiscible liquids, the the main main difference is that your density ratio will be changed, and the main main difference, if you change your density ratio is that the, the, uh, the, the, this type of effect, the dynamic pressure effect, will happen much earlier because now there's way more inertia in the surrounding gas. So the, the map would have to be changed. Uh, I'm not aware of many studies done for liquid-liquid systems, uh, although I imagine you could, ima you could put together an experiment where you're injecting uh, oil in liquid or something like this and try to characterize that. But I'm not aware of anyone having done that. Uh, I'm aware of, uh, so Jerry Faith uh, and his group did, uh, uh, updated the, the, or looked at the maps like this for a pressurized system. So pressurizing the surrounding gas to control and reduce the density ratio. But not, you know, the change of density ratio by a factor of two or three, not by an enormous amount. So liquid liquid is kind of the extreme version of that. I don't know exactly what this would look like. It's an interesting question. All right. Um, if there's uh, no other questions on this, um, we'll kind of wrap this up tomorrow. Uh, I want to talk a bit about the situation where gas carries the momentum. Uh, this is the most relevant for gas turbine type applications. And for that, there's a very nifty little theory that can be uh, brought to bear because the liquid is not turbulent typically because it goes sl slow enough to remain laminar. Uh, so we'll talk about that. Uh, talk a bit about what happens, or at least some of the things you can observe in fully turbulent situations, and um, and then essentially uh, close uh, on on that topic. So then tomorrow morning, uh, I'll uh, I want to talk also about research, and and talk more specifically about recent advance that uh, we've been able to make, especially using the type of tools LES and uh, uh, I'm sorry uh, 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 level set and VOF tools uh, that uh, that we've talked about. 
This afternoon, we'll do PLIC, we'll do some Lagrangian transport of a VAF, we'll put all this together and replace our level set with a full VAF code. All right. Okay, thank you for your attention.